Welcome to Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things, the podcast show. I am your host, Carrie Roberts. And on this show, I've had the wonderful pleasure to introduce people from all over the world, some that I've met for the first time, and we have the conversation, some I've known for years. And this one is a little bit extra special because this is someone I've met recently who is a local author um, and I would say teacher and educator in our community. I have Mr. Mike Farher. I'm so excited to have you here, Mike. Welcome. Thank you. I mean, we're like so close, we could borrow cups of sugar from one yeah. another. <laughs> I don't always get to do that. Knock, so that's, knock. I know, right? It's so exciting, but we're doing this online anyway, um, because we had all this snow. But I, you know, I wanted to bring you on because you and I met because um, you are teaching a writing class for kind of new authors. And I'm just so excited about the class. But before we kind of get into the teaching part, I want to start with you. Was writing something you always wanted to do? And if so, was there a type of style or a type of writing that you envisioned when you were young? Well, you know, I, I had this kind of thing that happened to me in the fifth grade that really stopped me from writing. So I, I, the, the short answer to your question is, I never had a writing aspiration because it was killed off in the fifth grade. And the fifth grade was, um, I had just written a memoir. I poured my heart into it. I remember it was over Christmas break. I submitted it the first day back from Christmas break at a Catholic school. And the nun gave me an F and a moron and wrote that on the, on the page. And at that moment, I said to myself, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm not articulate. So any writing dream I would have had would have been totally squashed and crushed. And it, it remained that way for, for 20 years. So the, the short answer is no. Um, there was a number of things that awakened the writer in me. Uh, the first one was, uh, I'm probably dating myself, but there used to be a, a columnist called Irma Bombeck. And Irma Bombeck had this, uh, she had a, an essay book called uh, if life's a bowl of cherries, this is the pits or something. And But she had a weekly newspaper column and she was a housewife. And just the way she wrote was so funny and playful that, you know, I'm not a housewife, I was a kid, but there was just something about her writing that really drew me in. I was also a voracious reader. I read everything from Mary Higgins Clark to Stephen King and all the mass market paperbacks that were going on in the, in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up. So that those were definitely big influences. So I was more of a reader than a writer. And then I took this personal empowerment course uh, in when I was 38. So that was about 20, well, almost 17, 18 years ago. And um, I distinguished that that piece of paper that the nun wrote that on was just that it was a piece of paper. But it was really just holding me back from writing. And then I started to write big time. Um, so, you know, it, it came to me a bit later in life. And I don't know whether or not I had an, a, a writing dream way back when, because it was squashed. Whatever was there was squashed so young. You know, I think that it's, everyone has a story like that, you know, whether it's everybody their, has their, a story <laughs> their writing, whatever it is, whatever they, they were excited about. And there's someone, sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's a random person. But there is something about the way something is said and you being, again, a writer. Why do you think that those just seeing that written in those words really affected you so much? Did it have to do with that particular teacher? Was it maybe something that you were maybe thinking yourself and it felt like that was validating it? Like, what do you think it is about that moment? And for a lot of people that really kind of stings for a while. That's a great question. Um, the other thing that was going on in my house when I was in the fifth grade was that I was a, a child of immigrant parents. My parents are both born in Ireland. And, you know, the the arts or going into the arts was very much discouraged. Um, that's a nice hobby, but don't go into that full time. Go out and get a good degree and that kind of thing. So I would say what Sister Ruth did sort of validated that, 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 you're not going to be defined as a writer or an author. Or, you know, my mom played the fiddle and a violin and, you know, but she didn't make her living that way. That's just a hobby. You don't make a living in the arts and, you know, get a good accounting job or whatever. So uh, it would certainly have validated that, uh, that mindset that was in the house. 
Yeah, I that's interesting. I mean, um, I don't know if I told you this, but I'm a dancer and uh, my whole background was in dance and um, had very supportive parents that always supported it, but had teachers that did not or people that would say stuff. So I totally understand kind of this resonating and, and trying to kind of separate yourself from that. And yet now you've written multiple books, you've done screenplays, you've done uh, these kind of films, which I think is just so incredible. Um, and I want you to kind of talk about, you know, so you did this course when you're in your thirties, when did you first start really writing and say, okay, I want to write a book and did you have an idea or did you just start writing? I just started to write and I started to write when I was reading the Boston Globe and I eventually won Pulitzer's for these, this round of reporting that was about the sex abuse scandals of the Catholic Church. They were blowing it open. And in fact, in 2015, they made a, a movie called Spotlight uh, with, I think, Michael Keaton was in it and Mark Ruffalo. That was based on that. So investigative reporting, Boston Globe newsroom. And it really gripped everybody, especially myself as a Roman Catholic. So I had an idea about two brothers. One was a priest and the other one was reporting on the church sex scandals and the writing eventually led them back. It, it emerged a killer out of the midst and it led both brothers back to the, the priest that abused them for this explosive climax. So I just latched onto that idea and it was really interesting because it wasn't until I almost had the book published that I just I discovered why I chose that to write about. And it was because I had an inappropriate relationship with a priest in my teens. And that's just so fascinating, right? Because it was just, I was trying to work something out in the written word that, you know, that's why you wrote the book. And when I figured out why I wrote the book, I, I took it away from my editor. I'm like, uh-uh, this needs to be bloodier. This guy would have been pissed off because I was furious, you know, that it actually, uh, it awakened that which had happened to me. So, um, you know, it was it was a combination of what was going on in the headlines, but there was something that I was responding to subconsciously and buried it, that those headlines awakened. I was working it out in my writing. And then it, I find that just really fascinating. And to your point about the the moderating that I'm doing. I wouldn't call myself a teacher, but I'm moderating this writer's group. It's almost like Weight Watchers for uh, with typewriters, you know? Um, but That's our new title of the of the group. That should be it. Um, but, it, you know, I was, I've was i been talking to some of the writers in that group, and it's interesting to ask the question, why are you writing about that? You know, why are you writing about that? And the answer especially for first time writers, is you're trying to make sense of something. So if you're writing a memoir, maybe you're trying to make sense about your life. Um, even if you're writing fiction, there's probably certain things that you're drawing from your background and writing them and putting them into a fictional form. You're probably trying to process something or make sense of your own world. And I think that's, that's as, that's as interesting as the story you end up writing down itself. Like I could write a book about what happened after I dis distinguished what Collard was really about. I, I took that book to the person that I had the inappropriate relationship. I said, I'm not cool with this. I forgive you. That led to him being removed from the priesthood, prosecuted, you know, so it just is such a journey when you embark in writing and you figure out what the book was really about, you know, that you're working something out. So I find that that's a fascinating, fascinating process. Well, and I congratulate you on, first of all, you know, being able to work through that yourself, um, be able to then share that with others and then confront this person. I mean, that's really brave um, to do something like that. And I think you know, one of the things, the first time you met with all of us in the writers group, one of the things that I noticed, I think the youngest in the group was 17 and I think the oldest was 87. Um, men and women mix in that very first class. And the conversation was about confidence and, you know, getting your writing out. 
And it's interesting as you talk about, you know, as we, we're writing something, you know, why are we writing it? Why is it this story? It relates to us personally. So was there a moment for you when you finished this book that you felt like maybe I shouldn't share this or this is actually fiction, but it's really part of my life? Oh. Like, what was that feeling like? Yeah, I remember the first copy of the book, I gave it to my mom and dad and I had it. I had to share with them what the book was about and why I wrote it because they didn't know was a family friend mm -hmm. and that you know i can never i'll never forget i was driving to a chili's on route one in north brunswick i know exactly where i was driving and i was just like shaking the steering wheel nervous to, to actually produce the book to my parents and say this is really what it was about um you know and, and so that part of it there was a lot of doubt about how that would be judged and then what actually happened when i wrote it was that it started this whole conversation. You know, there was, I was in writers groups. I was in SNAP, this survivors of network of people abused by priests. And it just started this dialogue where people were really just unprocessed anger. So that was, that was really cool. So that when I pushed back the fear of what, what people were going to think when I wrote it, then um, it just inspired such amazing dialogue, which is a writer is, that's what it's about, you know? So, and then I should say, because I know we're talking about this deep, dark book that I wrote, college, my first one. I do want to say that from there, uh, it, it's almost like, you know, lancing the boil, getting all the bad stuff out. What has emerged is a humorist and a comedy writer. And that's really what lights me up now, that, that it, it did allow me to find my voice. And right now, what's interesting to me uh, in the written word is to write books that, you know, I can make somebody laugh. If I, if I went to a bar right now, I know I can make the whole bar laugh. But what I'm trying to do as a writer, I'm trying to make you laugh without having the benefit of me telling that story. And that is a very high bar in writing humor that that's what interests me now. And it wasn't until I got complete and, and got all that stuff out of the way with my first book collared that this is your brain on shamrocks and the books and the plays and the and the the tv shows really emerged yeah I, again i love that and i think hearing the journey um you know something that happened to you so first you kind of say at age 10 you write something you pour your heart into it and you have this nun say it's not good to then having this horrible experience in your teens but then really not writing it until so many years later and now how it's transformed. And you and I met a writer a couple of weeks ago who also took 30 or 40 years to kind of write his book. And I think that's just kind of interesting how it comes out at the right time and how it transforms. And I actually, so you have a new book that you've done and I, <laughs> I was reading it right before and I did actually laugh out loud. So let me just say that I am not, I, I didn't grow up religious. So I don't know some of the context of, you know, of some of the connections here that maybe other people would. Um, but I just loved the dialogue because, um, you know, your new book is, is it kind of takes place in now and it's, it's about like these religious figures, but they're dating. And I just thought it was funny as I was eating my dinner, um, because you said, uh, I just want to read a little something. It says, um, so they're kind of asking Mary about, her relationship and her dating. And she says, for, for a moment, Mary stared at her before turning her gaze to the mug, warming her hands. Joseph was an amazing man, truly. He got me through those times and was just about the best protector a girl could ask for. Gabby put her elbow, elbows on the table. And in my head, I'm like, she goes, and? Just like it would be, you know, like two girlfriends together. And Mary continued with a smile. It was an arranged marriage and he was old enough to be my grandfather. So there's that. And I just like I that's how I heard it in my head. And just like little moments like that, that I think, you know, you would talk to us about really bringing the character through the dialogue, you know, imagining someone how they're sitting and and this kind of interaction. Um, I really like that in your writing. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about this new book. You know, you talked about yeah. this kind of you have, it, the you have it right there. I don't I, I took a picture of, of the picture of <laughs> Okay. of what it I was, was say, so like, I could read should, it on my phone. We, yeah. should, we should hold it up for product placement. <laughs> so the, the Mary in that in that 
story is the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the book is called The Last Temptation of Mary. And the premise of the book is that uh, Mary has come down to get complete with her past. She first time she was in an arranged marriage. And now, you know, in the in the Roman Catholic um, faith, she's known as the queen of love. And she is now coming down to earth again to find love on her own terms, not an arranged marriage. So here she is being adored in every church, the queen of love, and she doesn't have a love to call her own. And the devil, Lucifer, kind of picks up on that. And he goes, well, wow, isn't this amazing? What if I actually help her find a date? Maybe the man upstairs will, you know, curry, I could curry favor with him. So that was just a kind of a crazy premise. And then the archangels turn, you know, take human shape. So it's a little bit of a, a far-fetched uh, story using biblical characters, but putting them into very human situations. And one of the human situations that I was really looking to do, especially was with Lucifer. So in pop culture, you would have seen like the Witches of Eastwick with Jack Nicholson. He's a, you know, he's a stud and he conquers Susan Sarandon and Cher and he beds all them. Michelle Pfeiffer, he beds them all. And then Netflix has Lucifer where, you know, again, he's a bar owner, he's gorgeous and he's, you know, betting everybody on the cast. Um, I wanted this Lucifer to be like, whoa, this is the blessed mother. I'm in over my league. Ooh, okay. I'm, I'm like nervous. My palms are sweaty. He's not sure about himself at all. He's very insecure and he's a trickster, but he's, he knows he's in over his head and he's kind of neurotic about it. And I think a neurotic Lucifer would be, you know, a neurotic Lucifer meets a the Blessed Mother who's tr trying to find her way to find true love and not being in an arranged marriage. So I just thought all those elements would make good humor. And I, I always try to make, in my best moments, I try to make humor that also sometimes makes you think. Yeah. And I think like I, you know, we had talked about this in class about, you know, the value of dialogue and um, really kind of sh showing the character versus telling, you know, when you were kind of developing these characters, was this something that you had in your head already or you would kind of write and go back and and tweak? Like, how do you develop a character that you can showcase in dialogue that people can really get what you're saying just from reading something? Yeah, the, I guess the short answer is I talk to myself a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Same. It's so okay. I talk <laughs> to myself out, a lot. I mean, really ahead. like, you know, if I'm, um, so for my Irish books, for instance, or if I'm writing about an Irish character, um, you know, I, I, I can do an Irish accent because I was raised that mm -hmm. way. So it's like, well, you know, you used to do it that way at all. Do you know what I mean? So usent, U-S-E-N apostrophe T. It's not really a word. But that's how an Irish person would say it never was like that. It usent to be. So sometimes you have to actually, at least for me, assume the role of the character. And when I say assume it, like speak like them. And then try to phonetically get that down beat wise. Um, so you have to kind of know the character and you have to sort of assume the character's as well. Uh, this book in particular, because the last couple of years I've been really involved in films, this book was definitely, I saw it very cinematically. So at one stage, I actually did a table read. I wrote a script out of the book, at one piece of it, and I had some of my friends read it. And then as a writer, I just hung back and I listened to the dialogue. I was like, does that does that kind of flow? Um, so I did, that was a unique thing that I had never done before. Um, I would also say, you know, one of our Ryzen writers is my editor, uh, Laura Ginsburg, and a good editor is worth their weight in gold. And she would sometimes just come to me and go, you know, this just doesn't work. This just doesn't belong in the story. I don't think this character is believable. So sometimes you'd have to, as, as much as you crafted a character, you know, you have to trust your editor to say this, this character is just flat or you're using cliches too much. And 
that's hard to do sometimes, you know. Um, I will tell people all the time that uh, I don't actually consider myself a very good writer as much as I am a very good storyteller. So we were talking before we we jumped on that you actually dictate your writing and put it into a Google document. That is, I'm a better orator than orator, oral storyteller than an actual writer that's great with grammar. Sometimes like I just, I just get the story out and I let the editor help me purdy it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, getting that story and getting the dialogue down. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. And this time I, I tried to do a table read to make that, to have the, have the dialogue wash over me and hear the parts that didn't ring well. And that really, uh, I think, made the dialogue really good in this book. If I do say so myself, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, no, I I love that. And I think you're right. I feel the same way. You know, when you kind of talk it out, um, act it out, it adds a different level because sometimes we are so in it or so close to it. Um, I know when we had talked a while ago, you know, you've written multiple books and you had said when this came out, there was kind of different feedback. Um, some people that maybe liked the first few books didn't like this as much or some people like this better. How do you deal with feedback, good or bad? Are you somebody that reads everything? Do you not want to hear anything? Like, how do you deal with feedback when you've put, you know, your heart and soul and your time into something like that? I do read the feedback because I want to become better. Um, and I, you know, it's kind of interesting with this one because I've written, I've written a number of books about the Irish condition. You know, this is your brain on shamrocks, which by the way, you could find on this is your brain on shamrocks.com. Um, but my last three or four books have definitely been Irish heavy. And there was a TV series that uh, we optioned it into a TV series. So the TV series had quite a few uh, Irish characters in it. So, you know, I definitely wanted to move away from writing Irish characters and I wanted to write people of color. I wanted to write um, uh, non-binary, you know, like I wanted to write just a number of different kinds of characters. And, you know, I'm a middle-aged white guy. So I'm out of my league, you know, so, and that's why I had not only a priest and a, and a pastor read this manuscript. I also gave this to um, a gay person. I gave this to a person of color because I realized that I am a middle-aged white person trying to create characters that are so far away from my experience. I wanted to do that in such such a way to honor those different diverse backgrounds without putting a white male stamp on them. Um, so that, you know, that's what I did. And for the people that have known my writing for all these years, as an Irish writer and an Irish humorist, they would say, oh, you know what? I didn't connect as much with this book. And there's part of me that says, okay, good. You know, that good, because I I, I really went on a, on a deep part of the pool. I didn't go into this familiar shadow, a shallow part of the pool that I know. I, I really swam out as a writer and I took chances and you know, I'll leave it up to the reader to say whether I failed or succeeded. Um, but I'm, I know I stretched myself as a writer and, and I think that's critical. So there's, there'll be times when you'll, and I did pick up some new readers that only saw me for the first time in this book and then went back and I had a book club, a Zoom book club, and everybody went out and bought all my old books, you know, so I, I picked up some new readers along the way. And I, I did hear from other readers that have read every book I've ever read. They go, yeah, this may not be your best book. So it's the feedback was all over the place. And I, I try to take all of it um, constructively and especially the ones that, again, this book may not have resonated with them, with, resonated with them. I'm, I'm almost not afraid of that because I deliberately try to stretch myself. And in, in the process, I'm probably asking my audience such as it is to stretch with me and some will and some won't. 
Yeah, no, again, I think just from the beginning of our conversation today, you know, talking about kind of this element of bravery that you have of trying, but also I think a lot of people think writing is pen to paper or on my laptop by myself, just doing it alone. And I think you've kind of shared like, no, I did a table read. No, I asked, you know, opinions of someone else. No, I worked with an editor. So it doesn't, even though it's your book, you're still kind of getting outside help. And I think that that's an important thing to note because I feel like the stereotype is by yourself, don't talk to anyone. This is what it is. Would you agree with that? Well, certainly for the crafting of it, it is by yourself. Right. Uh, but then as you get closer to it, um, I do think those other perspectives are, are are really very, very valuable. And having a writing group like the one we're in, if we start mm -hmm. to share, you know, things with people, put it on a Google Doc and everybody comment on it. I mean, some of that feedback is is very, very valuable if it's constructive feedback. And I know that when I share the manuscript before it gets published with certain people, uh, I know that they have my best interest in mind and that they're committed to making this the best book it can. I will say that one of the things that we don't really talk about uh, as writers is, is it important to tell a story? Yes, but boy, is it important to be coachable. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you hired a personal trainer or if you hire an accountant to do your taxes and then you blow off all the advice, and you just file your taxes on your own. First of all, why'd you pay the accountant? And second of all, you know, you risk jail time if you've cheated the IRS. So, you know, if you hire somebody as a coach, like an editor, and you don't take their advice and you're and you're not coachable, then why'd you do it? And and an editor again is gonna see things that you do not see. And being coachable, that this book you worked so hard on, somebody's gonna call that baby ugly but they're gonna call that baby ugly because they're committed that this be the best book that they they can they can get out of you. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think it goes back to kind of even like, you know, your first interaction when you were 10, you know, noticing difference between somebody maybe just saying a, a comment that's maybe not helpful versus something that's constructive. Yeah. Or here's something to think about, yeah. you know, and and who Moron Moron was not helpful. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, again, who also is giving the advice? You know, is it a, is it a, another writer? Is it an editor, you know, being aware of that? And I want to talk a little bit about the filmmaking. So you had written these books. Um, some of them did turn into these films. Then you kind of did a, a short film fairly recently. Was this something, again, you had in mind? Or is this something that kind of just happened because of people kind of finding your book. Can you talk a little bit about that transition into the filmmaking? It, it was, well, in the middle of the, between the book and the filmmaking was playwriting. So that's really how it started. Um, I had a, a author, an actress friend of mine that said, you know, this, some of these Shamrock stories, she was Irish, she goes, they're so sweet, they're funny. I can kind of see this visually. So we took a couple of those and we workshopped them a little bit and I put them on at the Manhattan Repertory Theater uh, in this like new playwriting workshop the kind of thing was a 15 minute thing. And I sat in the back on opening night, very back row. And I watched a theater erupt with laughter and, you know, next to the birth of my children, that was the best experience I've ever had. So then it was watching characters you wrote come to life on a screen was I'm I'm just I'm still getting chills. Just it was just I can't even describe it. I'm getting emotional actually. Then somebody was in the audience, uh, and he came up to me. and goes, "I'm black," and I thought this was funny. This Irish stuff was funny. There's something universal here. Would you ever consider making this into a film? And I said, "Sure." So we did this option agreement where you know we agreed to develop this and i was like great we got an option agreement who's going to write the script and they're like you you know so <laughs> it was very you know it was very very much by accident but i'm very grateful that people saw things on a as, as a play and cinematically that i didn't certainly didn't write it that way but now that i've had that taste of it I found that The Last Temptation to Marry, my newest book, was definitely, I had the benefit of being a filmmaker writing a book so I can yeah. 
paint scenes better and 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 the dialogue and I looked at it very very cinematically. So this is the first book I wrote with the experience of uh, filmmaking under my belt. And it, I think it did change the way I wrote for sure. But yeah, it wasn't the grand plan to be a filmmaker for sure. And it, not a playwright, but man, am I grateful I did because it's just been, it's just been the adventure of a lifetime. It's just been so, so cool. I can't tell you. I, I'm like getting so excited for you because I think, you know, part of this show, I've done this show for seven years and I, you know, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It's this idea that, you know, uh, emphasis any- by the way, on the ordinary, because oh. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, I, I, I and I, I'm glad you said that I graduated some of come lucky from school. You're not talking about a guy that came out of the womb as a writer. So is this ordinary people doing extraordinary <laughs> things? emphasis on the ordinary people definitely well here's my thing right because i've had all different people all over the world you know top executives to authors to people who've lost weight right and it's this idea that like we all start off as just human beings and it's just this this concept of just taking that step to put yourself forward to try something to do something to make the effort and just what comes of that. And you see that, you know, when I say earlier, like, oh, did it just happen? It didn't just happen. You know, it's all the work and effort you put in. And then that one woman saying, you ever thought of it as a play? No, I haven't. And then you're like, okay, let me do that. And then that random person that in the audience that says, have you ever thought about this as a film? And just interesting how those things start to layer when we start to just take that initiative, but also do things that feel right for us. And to me, that's extraordinary. And it's just really exciting. And again, I, I congratulate you because that's such a huge deal. Um, and to hear you get so excited makes me so excited. And I think, you know, those of us in your class, that's part of, you know, we've always wanted to write a book, all different types of books in some capacity. But that idea that like not only to have something finished, but what could come of it that we can't even imagine, I think is something that's so beautiful and it's so exciting to see that happen to you and that, you know, 10 year old boy in fifth grade now kind of being like, yeah, we did it. And like so much more that you're doing. And I just think that's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I I would also say you just reminded me because I never even talked about this, but when you said, you know, executives and you've had these people on your podcast, I actually am an executive as well. So uh, as I've been doing this writing, I've no emphasis on just ordinary, Mike. (laughs) Well, I've been a, I've been a VP level in Fortune 50 companies, and uh, I've been in the biotech sector. So, you know, I share that because I would put my calendar, and I've also been an active parent and mm-hmm. went to all the kids' games. So, you know, I would put my busy schedule up against most anybody's busy busy schedule if you really want to whip it out. Um, but you know, you really do need to find the time to write, and that's something I I also want to impart to you taking my class. We, we were talking about this earlier mm-hmm. and also to anybody that's in listening or, or watching range that, you know, confidence and a lack of structure are the two things that keep everybody from writing, period, full stop. That's it. If you don't have the time in your calendar to write, it's not going to happen. And we all have that Sister Ruth or something where as you're writing, you're going, oh, this is a piece of crap. Nobody's going to write this, blah, blah, blah. And then again, you have your busy life. You have, you're chasing toddlers and you've got deadlines due and you have to get a PowerPoint presentation together. It's, it's, I get it. But if I told you that Bruce Springsteen was going to be at Asbury Park with Lady Gaga tomorrow, you'd rearrange your schedule to go there because it's important to you. And Side note, he was in Asbury Park recently. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. It was at the, it was at the Danny Clinch it. thing. Yeah. I know, damn. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it is with that, you yeah. know, you'd clear your schedule because that would be something that mattered to you and something that was important to you. And that's been really what's missing for a lot of people that try to embark uh, on writing is, is, is the structure and the commitment you know, it only takes 136 words a day times 365 days a year. You multiply that out, it's 50,000 words. It's a 200-page book. Two paragraphs a day, every day, you could have a 200-page book this time next year. Sounds easy, but it's easier said than done because people don't put the time on their calendar to do it. So, Well, I think, you know, you're, you're hitting on both points here. You're saying, look, I was an ordinary person that maybe did okay in school. 
Um, but I was extraordinary in my professional career, but also wanted to do something else for me. And I think that that's important too. You know, a lot of people as adults, especially as we age, we get on a path and we say, I want to do something else or something in addition to what I'm doing. And like you said, making that time, having that confidence and just starting and seeing that transition. And then for you to be teaching, I know you teach other, I say teach, moderate, whatever you want to say to the other classes that you do, but for the one you do at the bookstore, um, it was weird because I walked in and I've been wanting to write a book and I believe in signs, right? So I see this pamphlet and the woman's like, Kate says, you know, hey, we're doing this class. I was like, this, I have to go. This is like a moment, right? And I get there and there's 35 people in this small bookstore. And I was so, I don't know how you felt, but I was like, whoa, I did not think <laughs> that that many people would come, let alone the diversity of, of ages um, being there. And I thought that that was just such a cool moment and everyone giving a different reason as to what they want to write or why they want to write. And that was really inspiring for me, even though we're only meeting, you know, physically once a month. Um, so I just think that's great. And I, you know, I'm curious, do you have any other suggestions for anyone that's like, okay, I want to write a book. Maybe I'm not sure I'm lacking the confidence. Is there anything else that you would give as a suggestion for help? Well, if you're really just no kidding, starting to write a book, I mean that, you know, you got to get, that's a dream. I think I read a statistics once that 83% of the people think they either could want to write a book or had a good book in them. So most people probably have that unfulfilled dream. Um, and it is a matter of just, you know, if you are going to embark on that dream that so few people achieve, it's almost like right, running a marathon. Very few people run the New York Marathon when you commit to it and you sign up for it, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to buy some shoes and you're going to train. So writing is no different. So what I would suggest to people is just start with the writing discipline, write 130 words, 36 words a day, two paragraphs, write it every day for 30 days. Don't be thinking about, okay, I'm piecing together a book here. No, just write anything, write writing prompts, you know, describe your bedroom using the five senses whatever it is, and just get used to the discipline of writing every day, similar to like, you're going to walk, then you're going to jog, then you're going to be a full tilt runner to go into the New York marathon. It's no different. Anything that, anything that's a big goal like that, that requires endurance, you train for it. And I do think that people just okay, I got to write this book now, you know, and, and, and then, you know, what's worse is like, if it's that book you've been trying to write for like, you know, uh, 20 years, it's like this, <laughs> that's all you see. You don't actually see, you know, you can't see anything else, but this, and you're like, you know, so I tell people, okay, this, put that down, write something else because this is constipating you. you yeah. Know? And we've talked about that in our, yeah. our writing class and, and, You'd be surprised at how that frees people up. They go, you mean I don't have to write 136 words a day? It doesn't have to be the same thing every day? I'm like, no. So I, I do tell people to really, you know, train like you're going through a marathon because it, it is a marathon. It's a literary marathon. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great advice. Um, if people want to connect with you, they want to purchase any of your books, where's the best place to do that? So I have an author page, Mike Farraher. There's the spelling down there. Um, and I have an author page on Amazon. Um, this is your brain on shamrocks.com is my uh, website. And I also, from a writing perspective, uh, apart from doing the scripts and the books and the films, I've also, during the pandemic, started to help people with their resumes and LinkedIn profiles. So I have career letters is a website that you can find me on to get help with your resume and your LinkedIn profile. And then I also do dating profiles and that's loveletterprofiles.com, loveletterprofiles.com. That is actually my latest project that I made into a film because I've been getting these crazy wild dating stories that uh, they just were so cinematic that I made, I made two of them. I combined two people, I made this fictional character I put that down on a script. It won the London Screenwriting Film Festival. It was a semi-finalist, actually. That gave me the confidence to say there's something here. I filmed it in my house and at uh, Turnstile Cafe right around the block from where we live. 
and now it's going into the Garden State Film Festival and it's been winning awards. So, you know, that's another thing that's that's so cool out of the pandemic and trying to find work mm -hmm. as a writer. I, I just decided to make money out of dating profiles, which is I've been doing all along. And for that to lead into a film, you know, you just pick up a pen. You never know where you're going to go with it. Yeah, it's just, I it's so cool. Just the creativity. And again, we've heard so much on this show, again, how people live their lives, how they do things. There's so many ways to do it. And I love that you're sharing that. The last question I ask all of my guests, Mike, is what is one word or quote or mantra that you try to live by every single day? It would be something to the effect of a David Bowie quote about, um, you know, Get out of the shallow end of the pool. I mean, I'm I'm wearing a David Bowie Black Star <laughs> T-shirt, nice. you know. So, um, you know, when you venture into waters that you don't know and you're going deeper and you can barely find the bottom, that's when you're about to do something interesting. And I think that um, people get very afraid when they go into deep water and the fear is natural and to push through that, that's where real creativity lies and I, I i i get a lot of inspiration from from how david bowie thought about creativity and how he lived his life music aside it's music's great but him as a person how creative he was in different forms is really inspiring I love it. Well, thank you so much, Mike, again, for being oh, here, for you. doing this, and then also for all the great work you do for us locally as well. And I look forward to uh, hearing more that happens in the future. Great. And good luck on your writing as well. I can't wait to go to your book signing. Yes, that's the goal next year. So thank next you. Next year. We're all going to be there, all of us listeners and and watchers of, uh, of Extraordinary Things podcast. We'll all Perfect. be there. Thank you. Thank you so all much. All right. Take care.